Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about the criminal justice system and the role of mental or substance use disorders. Joining us in our panel today are Christopher Poulis, Juris Doctor Candidate 2016 at the University of Maine School of Law, Portland, Maine. Cynthia moreno Tui, Executive Director at the Association for Addiction Professionals and author, Alexandria, Virginia. Mary Lou Leary, Deputy Director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, Washington, D.C. John McCarthy, State's Attorney for Montgomery County, Maryland, Rockville, Maryland. Mary Lou, why is it important to address issues of mental and substance use disorder within the criminal justice system? Well, Yvette, uh, it's very important because there are so many people involved in the criminal justice system who do have substance use disorder or uh, mental health disorders. There are about 23 million inmates in this country, for example, and two-thirds of them um, have a substance use disorder or a, a mental health disorder. And uh, the, the system itself, whether you're starting with uh, your very first contact with law enforcement on up through uh, release, probation, parole, et cetera, there are opportunities at every point along that continuum to intervene and to give assistance to these folks. We, you know, we always want the criminal justice system, our goal is to make the system fair, efficient, and effective. It's not fair, it's not efficient, and it is not effective to ignore these disorders. We have an opportunity to provide treatment and assistance um, to these people. And in addition, we benefit because we know from research that when people do get treatment and assistance throughout the con uh, continuum of criminal justice, we have lower rates of recidivism, we have lower rates of relapse when people are released from the system. Very good. Uh, Christopher, does that vary any between the adult uh, justice system and the uh, young people and youth uh, system? Not much. What I would give is, is two examples. I met with a local superior court judge in Maine recently, and I asked him how many of the people that come before your court have some, something to do with a substance use disorder or something to do with intoxication of a substance involved in the offense or involved in, their, in the, the life that led to the offense. And he, without skipping a beat, just said, all of them. I pressed him a little bit more and he said occasionally, sometimes someone will come in where there isn't a substance use issue involved. So the statistics can actually be a little bit lower than the reality because it doesn't necessarily mean that the person is being arrested for possession or for distribution. Often it's other behavior that is t taking place in conjunction with an untreated substance use disorder. Like say a, a car burglary, that wouldn't be reported as a drug-related crime. However, if the person was addicted to heroin and was breaking into that vehicle in order to obtain money or something to sell in order to continue to support that habit, that is a drug-related issue. If we addressed that heroin addiction, almost invariably that car burglary would not occur. And in the juvenile system, Every one of my clients, in one way or another, whether it's the actual underlying charge or whether they were under the influence when the um, alleged conduct occurred, has something to do with either substance use disorders or a mental health condition, often both. Yeah, yeah I, I've been a prosecutor for 30 years in quite candidly. I used to, when we 
screen inmates when they come to the jails and you say, you know, were you under the influence at the time, at the time you committed a, your, your offense, whatever the offense is. About 90% self-reported that they're under the influence of either drugs or alcohol at the time. I used to jokingly say the other 10% were liars. I think, what, I think that what, what, what is actually happening now in the criminal justice system, as our jails are becoming the largest mental health institutions in the United States, I think generally speaking, Cook County Jail being outside of Chicago being a perfect example of that, one out of three of the inmates at the Cook County Jail, one out of three at Rikers Island, one out of three uh, of the LA County Jail in my own county, Montgomery County, it's 28% have identified mental health issues. And they're coexisting kinds of situations. These are not stovepipe types of situations. A person with a mental health issue is just as likely to be a drug abuser or an alcohol abuser in conjunction with that, which complicates yes, the treat, the treat, the uh, co-occurring issues that, uh, that really complicated. I know uh, Professor Lori Robinson, who chaired uh, the Policing in the 21st Century Commission that was just released as a result of a request by President Obama in March of this year, I attended one of her lectures recently, and she indicated that their study suggested that 50% of all police contacts in the United States today, 50% involve an individual who possesses or is involved in a mental health challenge at the time they're having contact with the police. So this is, this is an enormous issue for the criminal justice system in general, and it's an enormous issue for police training at the front end. I was just going to say for the training. It's a training Absolutely. issue. It's a training issue. Cynthia, let's talk about the families. Uh, what, what impact does the criminal justice system engaged individuals have on the family? Well, when you have a, a, a family involved, a, a person who has offended and been put in prison or in, let's say, county jail, what happens is this uh, abandonment that happens in the family system. So the children aren't sure anymore what to do. There's a question of financial security, particularly if that person was working and bringing home uh, the paycheck, what happens to dollars, what happens to family security, what happens to your reputation in the neighborhood if you're a young person, what happens to your reputation in the school, and then where's your connection? So how do you feel connected with that person who's now in prison or in the county jail? How do you stay connected? And how do you feel like you have a place in the community now that's more normalized? Mm, very good. In fact, it's, it's so common in the United States, one in 14 children has a parent who's incarcerated or has been incarcerated. And this has implications for the incarcerated individual as well because that person hopefully will eventually be released and hope to rejoin his or her family. But there's been this big period of disruption that affects all of the relationships. And it's the very challenging. And Mary Lou, I also want to touch on, um, as we're talking about the population overall that is engaged in, in criminal activity and, and, and with, the, with the justice system, are there differences in, in ethnic, racial, and gender uh, issues that, that we need to address in this country? Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely, there's tremendous disparity in, in the criminal justice system. And if you look at the incarcerated population, African Americans are five times more likely to be incarcerated than Caucasians. It's a, a huge uh, disparity, and Hispanics are twice as likely as whites to be incarcerated. That does not mm -hmm. reflect the actual perpetrators of crime, the racial, ethnic identity of folks who, who actually commit crimes. It's just the incarceration. So we have a big, a big issue here, and there are many factors that um, contribute to that, but we can't ignore that. We really need to address it. And, and one of the big factors that affects that is poverty. So Absolutely. when you have people uh, in poverty, living in poverty, lack of job or job skills, you're finding more offenses uh, done because they're looking to survive and they're looking to find a way to do that. And so in terms of correcting that, you've got to look at that whole community system and what we're doing to help with that transition so that that doesn't continue to occur. If I could briefly touch on that, I think there's two factors involved in that, and there's multiple factors involved in that. Um, but one of them is insulation. Say you're a juvenile that lives in a middle class or upper middle class neighborhood, a suburb, then 
there will be a much different experience. Chances are you will not even have interaction with law enforcement if you, for example, are smoking marijuana. Whereas if it's a neighborhood where they're constantly patrolled Patrolling. by people, there's actually different types of enforcement in different neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And economics and race have a big role in that. Absolutely. And I want to get back to that uh, during our next panel. We'll be right back. Criminal justice involved individuals with behavioral health issues who are re-entering the community can seek help in primary care settings and other health facilities. If they are involved with a community or faith-based organization, these entities may also provide guidance, mutual support groups, and other assistance. To get help, these individuals may also turn to SAMHSA's Behavioral Health Treatment Services Locator. This is an online source of information for persons seeking treatment facilities in the U.S. or U.S. territories for substance abuse, addiction, and or mental health problems. SAMHSA also offers resources relevant to people with mental or substance use disorders who have been involved with the criminal justice system. For example, two Road to Recovery television shows that are now available free online may be helpful. Treatment and Recovery in the Juvenile and Adult Criminal Justice System and Addiction and the Justice System, Deciphering the Maze. These shows provide step-by-step -step insight as to how the systems work and describe best practices in addressing the intersection of criminal justice and behavioral health issues. They can be viewed at the SAMHSA.gov website under Recovery Month. Staying on course without support is tough. With help from family and community, you get valuable support for recovery from a mental or substance use disorder. Join the Voices for Recovery. Visible. Vocal. Valuable. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Christopher, I want to get back to what you were saying about the patrolling in the various neighborhoods. And, and, and we earlier mentioned uh, differences of ethnic, racial, gender uh, issues. Uh, so can you link the two and talk a little bit about what you've been able to observe uh, with these patrolling patterns? Sure. Um, frankly, people that have political clout are going to have a different relate have had, we're hoping to change this, and I'm happy to talk about the programs we're implementing to change this if we have the opportunity. But as it stands, and in the past, there's a different type of policing that goes on in upper middle class neighborhoods versus um, neighborhoods that are economically challenged and have high minority concentrations of the population. And you just don't see doors getting kicked in in upper middle class neighborhoods. But studies have shown that the same type of drug use, the same type of distribution happens in different communities. Very good. John, in, in terms of the, the, the systems that you're engaged with, um, does, does the drug court system, and explain a little bit of what that is for our audience, does that help to mitigate some of these imbalances and in, in how, how individuals are treated by the, by the courts? Well, we, we've had a drug court in Montgomery County for about 10 years now. We've had 17 graduating classes uh, of individuals who have gone through our drug court. And, Drug court's not an easy way out. It's an alternative to incarceration. It was uh, championed, and uh, all these drug courts around the country seem to be championed by uh, spectacular judges who come to the fore in, in our county. It's a judge by the name of Nelson Roop who helped establish our drug court. Uh, but it, it, it gives us an alternative, and we are taking hardcore, repetitive criminal offenders, and we're diverting them generally for up to two years. The average drug court graduate, this is, you're changing human behavior, and if people don't understand it, you go into rehab, uh, a successful rehab for a drug offender, if you ever, they ever published their statistics of success, it'd probably be around 10%. If you're in the middle teens, you're doing great. Changing human behavior or addiction issues is not simple, usually doesn't happen. There's no magic bullet for turning these people around, but uh, with our drug courts, after about two years, and, and the, the problem with most of these rehabilitation programs from my standpoint is they're just simply too short. They're not long enough uh, to change the chemical imbalances in the brain and to get the people to change the behavior, to change their associations of people who lead them back to drugs or alcohol. And, and that's been the success of it and it's a diversionary program. We meet regularly. It's, it's an intensive weekly uh, program that we actually, another thing that we do is we run our drug courts at night. 
These are volunteer programs run by judges who come in at night. And the way, reason we do it at night is because we want to make sure that the people that we are treating while they remain in the community can get employment. And so if you right. run these drug programs or these diversionary programs during the daytime, what you're actually doing is almost self-defeating because right. the reality is well, you're, you're running interrupting the, the, well, the they can't go to activities work. of daily living. Well, they can't, they can't make a living. They got, so our programs all begin at 6 o'clock at That's night, and, and it just makes more sense because then you can go to work, feed your family, and we do it in the evenings, and that has been a magic bullet for us to stabilizing the work uh, as well as the individual. That's an unusual and really a terrific approach because uh, one of the things that, what, that we know about human nature in general, um, and it certainly applies to people who have substance use or mental health disorders, is that self-respect and respect from others is a really critical component of recovering and maintaining long-term recovery. And if somebody has the opportunity to actually be gainfully employed and have colleagues at work, for instance, and so on, that helps. Every one of those kinds of things really helps with the self-respect and earning the respect of others and fighting off the stigma that is associated mm -hmm. with, for instance, substance use disorder. Destigmatization is critical to success and to recovery. Absolutely. So, Cynthia, we've talked about what some of the uh, opportunities are through the drug courts. And for those individuals that didn't have that opportunity, in other words, that are within the system already, can you talk a little bit about the benefits of providing them with treatment uh, while they're incarcerated? So it is really helpful to provide treatment in, in incarceration. Part of that is so that they can begin right at that time to start changing their brain patterns. So we know that the limbic system is very engaged when they're using alcohol and drugs. And that limbic system does not change just because you're incarcerated. In fact, it pushes the limbic system to be more active. That survival, that fight or flight is gonna kick in. So if they're not learning while they're in, in, an, incar in an incarcerated situation, how to change their brain and their thought pattern, then when they get released and they have more stress getting released and fear of transition, then it kicks in even deeper and that triggers the relapse. So oftentimes we, we don't use the brain search that we know today to help people in transition or to help them when they're incarcerated. There are some prison systems that are doing wonderful work with um, working with the people incarcerated, teaching them how to change their brain, teaching them how to be peer helpers within the prison, helping other people to do that. So that it, what it does is it continues to help them stay in that thought process, in their cognitive thought process versus their limbic thought process. If, if, if I could add something, you know, particularly with uh, the more powerful drugs like heroin that are so addictive, that are, that, 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 that are that's so alter brain waves, uh, one of the things that we found, st uh, and this is, is, is that individuals who go into treatment for drug addiction, particularly heroin and powerful drugs like that, that uh, the treatment modalities are so short, whether it's 30, 60, or 90 days. What percentage of people who go into treatment for heroin after 60, 90 days are able to kick their habit in 60, 90 days? The answer nationwide is about 4%. Mm -hmm. So after you've exhausted, exhausted all of your metal, medical health uh, treatment options, all of the things that you have under your medical health plan, you're still left with the disorder of 96%. Mm -hmm. It's also the problem within the criminal justice system. We, you have to recognize that changing these behaviors and getting a person w ready to change mm -hmm. their behaviors, this is a long, these are not short-term solutions. Mm -hmm. I, oftentimes, uh, compared with uh, some people that I've talked to, have compared uh, uh, the addictive power of heroin to someone who has a, uh, cancer and someone says to them, well, I can give you, you really need 10 chemotherapy treatments, but we're going to give you three, and we're going to hope that those three take and your cancer is going to be cured. Well, that's right. what we're doing with heroin and so many of these addictive services. They're not intensive enough. They're not long enough mm -hmm. to change uh, the way we mm -hmm. think and the powerful hold that those drugs have on these individuals. I want to go to both Cynthia and, and Christopher. You both are in recovery. And Cynthia, in, in your experience, when you were going through the, 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 the justice system, uh, what could have made your exit more uh, solid and successful in terms of reintegrating you to the, to the community? So I, was a, I, I got in the juvenile justice system at a very early age, at uh, the age of 11. 
Um, and what would have probably helped me to move out of that system before, uh, and I moved out of that system uh, officially at the age of 18, but unofficially at the age of 15 and a half, was some housing that would be um, more stable. So I didn't have stable housing. Um, I was in an abusive situation, so I needed to be in a, a situation that was safer and with adults that were safe. Uh, I needed to be out of off the streets. Um, streets can be pretty hard. It's hard to get clean, right, when you're on the street. So it's important to, to have that. And it would have been helpful to have some counseling to understand what my circumstances were and what my choices were. When you're, when you're young and being uh, in a criminogenic behavior pattern, people see that criminogenic pattern. However, they don't see what causes that pattern. And I think one of the things that is important is to understand what's behind the pattern so that then you can help them release that pattern. You can't release something you don't know that you have. And so you help them understand that and then you give them choices. And the last thing I will say, without opportunity to change, people don't change. So I was a foster child as well. And in the foster care system, you don't have a lot of choices and you don't have a lot of opportunity. And so if you don't have that opportunity to, you know, get support, mentoring in high school, uh, helping with your studies in high school, it's so much easier to stay on the street and be supported by other people who are similar to you. Christopher, any thoughts in terms of your own experience? Sure, plenty. <laughs> um, first off, I think, and this kind of addresses your earlier question about what could be done for people that are incarcerated. And I think comprehensive reentry plans need to be developed when the person is sentenced or earlier. This process needs to begin. Mm -hmm. And people returning from prison need to be treated as returning citizens rather than ex-cons. So, for example, in my own life, I was able to make it through the process of being admitted to practice law in the state of Maine, represent juvenile clients, complete an internship with the Office of National Drug Control Policy, be admitted to law school, but I have trouble renting an apartment. There's, I maybe couldn't work at, and I won't name a, a company, but there's many companies that just simply would not allow me because of the fact that I have a first time nonviolent drug offense on my record from my early 20s. So we need to address the collateral consequences. My view is that once you've paid your debt to society, it should be paid. You know, when I was sentenced, the judge didn't say, by the way, you, you know, you, you may not be able to vote in some states, you may not be able to find employment or housing for the rest of your life. That wasn't part of the plea agreement and that's not what this country um, stands for. Okay. And so when we return, I really want to follow up on that and really talk about also uh, getting to the whole issue of, of justice reform, because that, what you're talking about is offering opportunities for individuals to re-enter into their community life and to find gainful employment, to find housing. Education is yet another area where right. someone who's been in the justice system is also affected. So. We'll be right back in order to continue our conversation. Our drug court works with nonviolent felony offenders who have acute substance use uh, and or mental health disorders. Uh, the average participant in our program uh, has two felonies and 10 misdemeanors on their record. So they're individuals who have been through our uh, criminal justice system a number of times before and jail and prison simply hasn't worked um, or helped to solve the problem. Participants, when they come to the drug court, some of them are in denial how bad their alcoholism or drug addiction is. We really focus on targeting uh, individuals who are highest risk and highest need and getting them into the appropriate treatment programs and getting them involved in, with the appropriate supports to make changes in their life in the community. So I've seen the roadblocks, I've seen the vicious cycle keep coming back. So my role as an advocate 
Roby Carby Coach is to help people to meet them where they're at and try to assist them to build them up. And basically what I say is, how can I help you help yourself? And I will do my best to find the resources to help someone. For our drug court, it's important that we incorporate evidence-based treatment practices and operate in accordance to uh, the best practice standards that the National Association of Drug Court Professionals um, has articulated. We view ourselves as an accountability program, not a punishment program. So it's accountability to the requirements of the court, and it's accountability to a treatment plan. And that's what we really bring together uh, during a court hearing and when we're working with and evaluating our participants' progress. The drug court is fair. They, they, we, do everything in our power to make people successful. Everybody in the program um, that I came across was all on my side to be successful and supportive. No one wanted me to fail. A person who has been in our drug court, whether they completed successfully or not, is 98% less likely to have been arrested one year after they completed or were discharged from our program. Three years out, 73% less likely to have been arrested. This work means everything to me. Um, I absolutely love my job. And working in the criminal justice system, I, I feel this is one area where we are really able to have a positive impact on people's lives. And to see that impact, not only in the short term, um, but in the long term through the relationships that we develop and maintain with our participants and our graduates. I began to struggle with addiction actually at a very young age. My mom was a single mom and she did the best that she could to raise me. I'm not blaming my addiction on, on that, but I, I do think that it may have been a factor in the way that it happened so young. I started misusing alcohol, marijuana, and other drugs by my early teenage years, even 11, 12 years old. I was starting to have issues with substances. These issues increased through my teenage years and in my early 20s until I finally, there came a point where I reached a spiritual bottom and I was ready to, for the first time in my life, seek help and ask for direction. Uh, all the time when I was growing up, I always wanted to do whatever I wasn't supposed to do. And I always, I, you know, I, I never felt comfortable in my own skin. And drugs and alcohol for a while allowed me to feel comfortable in my own skin, but eventually, I realized that that life and those addictions no longer served me. And thank God that I had that realization when I was 24 years old. What recovery has allowed me to do is it's allowed me to work with people at the highest levels of government at the local, the state, and the federal level. It's allowed me to attend and graduate college. It's allowed me to tend, attend and just about graduate from law school. I'll be graduating from law school in May. It's allowed me to practice law in the very same court where I was once a juvenile defendant myself, and it's allowed me to complete an internship with the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. More importantly than any of that, it's allowed me to show up for my family. Recovery has allowed me to be part of my family, part of my community, and add to the community that I once hurt. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved, or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. Mary Lou, in our last panel, Christopher was mentioning the need for more reform in terms of individuals that are coming out of the system to be able to gain housing, to be able to gain education, to be able to reintegrate into the community at a faster rate. And I suspect there are other areas where reform is also necessary. Can you speak to what the administration is doing in terms of taking a look at the criminal justice system and creating reforms that are going to be cost effective and, and quite frankly, more accommodating to really 
putting individuals back into our communities. Yeah, this this is a very exciting moment in, in time, Yvette. Um, I spent 30 years in and around the criminal justice system, many of those years working as a prosecutor. And I think that this is an extraordinary moment in time because you have bipartisan recognition that we can't incarcerate our way out of this problem. States can no longer afford to just keep building prisons and incarcerating more people. We simply can't afford it. And moreover, there's a recognition that it doesn't work. Folks come out and within two, three years, they're right back into the system. And so there's a collective recognition. We need to take a different approach. What we've been doing for decades does not work. And in the words of former Attorney General Eric Holder, we need to get smart on crime. And that means being fair, being just, and looking at the consequences down the road. So uh, for instance, uh, this administration has been operating on many different fronts. In 2010, for instance, bipartisan legislation called the Fair Sentencing Act was passed, was strongly supported by the Department of Justice, and that legislation eliminated the disparity in federal sentencing, federal penalties for crack cocaine versus powder cocaine. And then that same year in 2010, the Attorney General, Eric Holder, issued a memorandum to all federal prosecutors saying, you need to stop going by the policy that was dictated by the previous administration, a memo from that attorney general which said, charge the most serious penalty, uh, excuse me, the most serious crime with the heaviest penalties that you possibly can, given the facts before you. Eric Holder said, no, that's not how we're going to operate. Our basic principle is you charge based on the individual circumstances of the case and the defendant, you do what's fair and what's just, keeping in mind the safety of the community. That's a, f a fundamentally different approach, and you've got agreement, I think, across the board on that. You have organizations that include both the ACLU and the Koch brothers coming together in agreement on the need for this to be, make the, the criminal justice system more just. Well, that's that's encouraging. So there's one level, which is the federal level. There's also the local level, John. What what changes have taken place, or uh, and 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 what changes need to take place even further uh, thus far in terms of reforming the system? Well, I think a lot of states, and including my own state, are beginning to look at uh, mandatory minimums for drug offenses. I think that that's a challenge, and I think that's a debate that's happening in state legislatures everywhere, whether or not. You know, uh, as Mayor Lou was just talking about, uh, based on the directive uh, uh, from Mr. Holder, uh, you would not have an opportunity to look at the individual person or the background of an individual. And I think this is what offended judges. I don't think judges ever wanted to be hamstrung with mandatory sentencing. I think they wanted to be open and be allowed to consider uh, the full panoply of, of pot potential options with an individual. So I think there's an examination going on in many states about whether or not they're appropriate for nonviolent crimes, minimum mandatories are, are important. I know that in the federal system, and again, I'll go back to Mary, Mary Lou on this, you, uh, I know that there, there, the, the two-level departure down for, for nonviolent drug offenders, that, well, I think there were 4,000 federal prisoners that were released in October. I think over the next year, there was an examination of an additional 40,000 low-level nonviolent offenders in the federal level, where they're beginning to look at whether or not, you know, the first, the most important days of incarceration are not the last days you spend in jail. The most important days that you spend incarcerated are the first days of your incarceration. And these ex ex extraordinarily lengthy sentences, people are beginning to look at these things and beginning to say, well, what is the most, when is it really useful? When do uh, the utility of a sentence actually maximize itself out? What we're doing in Maryland, and I have a Republican governor who is, 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 has suggested uh, a restoration act. What he wants to do is he's looked at uh, how quickly people are being paroled on nonviolent crimes, particularly drug crimes, and, and un, uh, believe it or not, the drug offenders are staying in my state incarcerated up to 40 or 42 percent. He wants to roll that back to 25 percent for nonviolent drug offenders and say you'd be eligible for parole at 25 percent. He wants to take the money that's saved from that delta of 25 percent to 42 percent, 
put it in, I'm a little bit suspicious about this myself, but put it into a lockbox and make sure that money then would be available exclusively for drug treatment, for the creation of additional beds, for treatment back into the community. I salute my, I, I embrace that. I salute my governor for doing that. So I know that in Maryland, Governor Hogan is looking at that particular option. Uh, and we have some other kinds of things. Uh, problem solving courts are being established all over the United States. And what are those? Problem solving courts are, are things, things like, we've talked about this briefly in an earlier portion. The drug courts are a, an alternative to incarceration. They're an alternative mm -hmm. to locking someone up. And we try to, through creative means, try to deal with an individual who's been all too often in our system. We, mental health courts uh, in the state. We, we are in the process of establishing mental health courts at both levels of our courts in Montgomery County. We had eight individuals, just to give you an example of how the system is broken. We had eight individuals last year that came through our jail collectively 250 times. Their core issue is a mental health issue. Mm -hmm. We saw them, mm -hmm. eight people, we saw 250 times. Mm -hmm. Now, I gotta believe that we can do a better job. We have failed those people. And unfortunately, the other thing that, that, that frightens me sometimes is if you do not deal with a mental health issue, the first time you see someone at a very early age to come into the criminal justice system, these can, things can escalate into more serious crimes. Mm -hmm. In one 12 month period of time in my county, we had 12 homicides that were committed in my county and every one of them, as soon as they came across my desk, what I saw was a profound mental health issue by an individual who we had seen before. And if we had dealt with it more properly at an earlier stage, we may have been able to prevent multiple murders in my own county. Well, and that really takes good assessment. You've got to have people on board who know how to assess the mental health issues and the addiction issues so that they're assessed appropriately and referred to the appropriate treatment for, as you were saying earlier, not a short length of time. It, it needs a longer length of time because to, to actually change those patterns take a long time. And if you look at some of the new treatment information, people are saying they need to be connected in a safe environment or a supportive environment for five years. So that doesn't mean that they're going to treatment every week for five years, but they're getting some type of support, whether it's a monthly check-in support group or family support group every month for five years so that they're feeling solid. They're feeling like they're getting the support that they need. You know what people, I've heard this said oftentimes with people in terms of the reentry program. Everybody's coming back into our communities. That's, that's, that's the functional reality. We don't lock up many people for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, the charge then, therefore, is how best can we make that person in a position where they're going to have a job and jobs and housing mm -hmm. and, and, and with the mentally ill, uh, a sustainable medication program because I think it's the failure to maintain medications. And we also, really John, huge need to look at peer support, correct, Cynthia? I mean, this is, I, I think you were getting at that, that in essence, a, a complete 360 of, of the best possible reentry pro, re programs really take into account having an, a peer perhaps or someone that's been through the system and has reintegrated already right. sort of lead the way for the person who's coming out. Well, I think the peer support is important for the person who has been incarcerated and for the family because it's, it's a tough walk. So if they're getting that peer support and the other piece to, to this reform is community enhancement. Many of the people uh, are from communities that are low income. If we're not doing community enhancement, poverty reduction, then we're gonna continue to see this because it's more than the mental health issue. It's more than the substance use disorder. It's also the lack of opportunity for income. I wanna come back to Christopher uh, right now and have him address the issue of, let's go back to federal versus state. Sure. In your state of Maine, for example, what can citizens do to really begin to advocate, quite frankly, for the changes that need to be made, particularly for the young people that you're seeing, in terms of asking for, what should they be asking for that the system provide for, for the youth? What we need and what we need to ask for is a balanced approach to drug policy that emphasizes not only supply reduction but demand reduction. Uh, that's been done at the federal level. So the ONDCP, for example, has an entire department for demand reduction, a branch for recovery. That should be implemented 
at state and local levels as well. And people, you know, citizens at the citizen level can talk to their local representatives, talk to their elected officials, talk to the prosecutors, and advocate for themselves, for their families that have been affected by these issues. Um, there's all sorts of programs right now that are happening at the state level, the local level, and the federal level to address criminal justice policy reform, and I've worked in each of those areas at, you know, whether it's sentencing reform, the one thing about the moment, everyone is talking about how we are in this moment. This work is not new, only the cameras are. That's a quote by Mark Maurer of the Sentencing Project, who's been a mentor of mine for some time. I was legal fellow at the Sentencing Project last summer. And what we need to find out is how we can turn this moment into a sustainable movement because any changes in Congress, frankly, are only going to nip around the edges of mass incarceration. We have 2.2 million people incarcerated. People, it's great that we're starting with low-level nonviolent drug offenders, not going to make a huge dent in the population. We have to look at the length of sentences. There are so many things after, you know, why 27 years instead of 20? What's, what's occurring between year 20 and year 27 that has not occurred prior to that? It actually becomes counterproductive but when a we come area. back, When we come back, I want to get at, at, at that because, you know, the, uh, we can certainly talk about putting people, you know, 44,000, you know, as you mentioned, John. But in essence, let's talk about really is society ready to absorb all these folks and what are we going to do with all of them given the fact that the, the, the money's still in the lockbox? We'll be right back. A lot of people with mental and substance use disorders, a high, high percentage have histories of trauma that, that have affected their mental illness or affected their, their substance use disorders. And so when you put them in a system that has been known to be traumatizing, that is very punitive, that is not really what we, we call recovery oriented, that can re-traumatize folks. And so um, there's a lot of, of, of talk and a lot of action around prison reform now, and there's a lot of pris prison uh, and jail officials who are looking at creating systems that are a little bit more user friendly, but also are more conducive to helping people uh, recover. And so uh, addressing trauma on a systemic level is a really, really important thing that people don't get re-traumatized over and over and over again. The drug court system in the United States is, uh, is a system that is really becoming more and more conducive to helping people stabilize and initiate long-term recovery. Um, the idea of drug courts is to keep people from jails and prisons and to put them through drug court programs that will uh, help them access treatment and help them access recovery support services. And uh, in, in, in a court ordered nurturing environment, and this is a really, really important thing and has had a great deal of success in people staying out of the, the criminal justice system and being able to use that court uh, ordered system to re-enter into society. My life was totally upside down, unmanageable, um, a wreck, um, homeless, all kinds, you know, just in a dark world I didn't want to be in. You know, my wife had left me and took my two boys. My life was just falling apart and um, I knew I needed to be serious about getting clean and sober and this, this drug court program seemed that it would, it would uh, give me the accountability and the monitoring that I needed uh, at the time because I was severely addicted to both alcohol and drugs. The drug court model is based on a, a, a theoretical concept called therapeutic jurisprudence. And that is the idea that you're blending the authority and coercive aspects of the court with the therapeutic uh, approach and supports of uh, treatment you will get the therapy and education that will help you change your life. The biggest benefit is the um, ongoing accountability, um, the, um, the structure of the program, 
uh, the fact that the whole staff, the judge, probation officers, the whole staff relating to drug court are, are basically, you feel they're on your side. They don't want you to fail. There's plenty of tools in this program that if someone has the willingness to follow through and incorporate them into your life. I was losing my life. I was losing my family. I was losing my health. I was, uh, you know, a possibility of losing my job. And um, I have all those things back today. And as we keep evolving in our recovery, as long as we keep on the right path, our life will change, get better. I'm coming up on 18 months clean, and it's been totally different life. I know it's still a struggle, and it probably always will be, but it's getting better and better and better little by little. I'm very honest person today. I don't lie. I think my soul feels so good to be an honest person because I used to be a huge manipulator huge liar, um, a thief, everything in between, and I don't do those things today. And it feels good to um, do the right thing today. Welcome back. Mary Lou, uh, let's talk a little bit about how are communities going to be able to handle, or not, all these individuals that are re-entering society that are going to be released? Yes, well, it's a challenge, that's for sure. Um, I think that the more notice that communities have, of course, you know, the better prepared they, they can be. What I think is important is that people, people understand who is coming back to the community, why are they coming back. It's very important for um, and participants in the criminal justice system, for instance, to educate the community so that they understand folks are getting released uh, not to come back and prey on the community. They're being released because they're nonviolent offenders who have served a, a lengthy sentence and the assessments that we have done show us that these people are not dangerous. Now they will have needs and the community needs to anticipate that. So for instance, if private nonprofits, private industry and government agencies can come together to pool their resources to provide whatever they can to help support these individuals who are coming back to the community. So for instance, jobs, housing, Treatment mm -hmm. critically important. Substance but in essence, treatment. in order in order for that to happen, Mary Lou, and and, and I agree with you absolutely, uh, uh, Cynthia. I think you were uh, you were getting ready to say something. I was just going to piggyback on what you're saying, Mary Lou, because communities need to develop some strategic thinking and planning around this, and they need to do it now. Mm -hmm. And they bringing all those partners together that you mentioned into community, looking at a recovery-orientated system of service and care for the whole community that includes the people who, who are family members, the person who has been incarcerated, the justice system, and the support systems that include education, medical, dental, all of these other pieces and build a system that works in their community. It's not gonna be cookie cutter for every community. However, if you don't put thought into it, you know, nothing will happen. And John, are, are, are systems going to be able to already provide a profile to, to these community-based organizations or, or how, how are these services well, through a recovery-oriented system of care ideally, let's talk about the ideal, work? Well, first of all, you've got to have available places to put individuals, particularly the transitioning. I, I think one of the great challenges is that the people living in the federal system coming back to states or regions like the metropolitan area. I will tell you, we have a, a, a pre-release center that transitions people from six months to a year as they're coming back into the community. And they are stabilizing exactly what Mary Lou talked about, housing, and we're, sta we're getting them jobs. And we're making sure there's a treatment plan in place before they go out to the community. Uh, unfortunately, from what I understand, in the metropolitan area here in Washington, D.C., none of the other state-run agencies or uh, local counties are accepting people for, for transition back into the community. So you've got to get a better federal-local partnership between some of the different counties mm -hmm. because they're not taking the prisoners back from the federal system. And, you know, 
somebody's going to come back and live in Montgomery mm -hmm. County, well, let's stabilize their housing, let's stabilize their treatment plan, etc. Uh, I, I think that is a, a, a huge problem. I, I th uh, there also was a, a term that was used. I think we need to use social science research to guide us better in making our decisions. Uh, you can't do the social science research and then ignore the social science research. Whether it's helping us assess who should get locked up pre-trial or whether it's helping us assess, based on the studies that have been done, who should be released after they've been incarcerated for whatever period of time it is that Chris was talking about. Uh, I, I am one who is a huge proponent of using, using social science research as a basis for us making intelligent decisions and then going back into our individual communities and explaining why did this person get locked up or not locked up pre-trial? Well, this is what the science tells us. I think if we have a dialogue with our communities and explain to them the rationales behind the decisions we've made about who gets released versus who gets locked up, and it's, a, and it's not race-based or ethnic-based or otherwise-based, but it's based on research, I think that builds faith in the criminal justice system, which we so sorely need. And Cynthia, that would entail really dealing with issues of stigma. How do we do that? Well, it starts from the very beginning. It starts from when that person who has offended is right before you, whether it's the probation officer or the judge, uh, treating that person with respect, having cultural humility. Cultural humility is uh, not, not saying that I'm culturally competent, because I can't be culturally competent about every person. But I may have a humility about their situation that I know that I don't fully understand where they come from. So I approach it with respect, I, re I approach it with honoring, and that goes all the way through to if they get incarcerated, they're treated with respect and humans at, continue as humans so that when they're released, they still have that, that feeling of respect, that feeling of belonging, and it helps to integrate them back into their family and their community much better. So that's part of the social science. It's even the language we use. Am, is, is this person a prisoner? Is this person an inmate? Are, there, are, are they a person who committed a crime or a person who committed an offense? Are they person first or are they offense first? That absolutely makes sense. I know that SAMHSA has quite a number of programs that uh, are dealing with reentry issues and that they can be found online. Um, but any other particular programs, uh, Christopher, that you, you think uh, communities can avail themselves to if they are looking for model programs? Absolutely. First of all, the most important thing is I've found that if you treat a human being as a human being, they will often behave as a human being. Mm -hmm. By people re-entering, uh, when I re-entered society, by people finding people who welcomed me back in as a returning citizen, as a community member, that made me want to be a returning citizen, want to be a community member. So that's essential as, as a full community-based holistic approach to these issues. So Michigan is a great example on reentry. The Michigan Prisoner Reentry Initiative takes a holistic approach that begins when the person is sentenced. They have steering teams with 17 specific areas where they look at where it's coordinated based on the individual's characteristics, the individual's risk assessment, and it's a coordination between local and state entities that involves everyone from community leaders, faith leaders, leaders, counselors, peer recovery, organizations such as Young People in Recovery, which is a national organization that I'm part of, and we create recovery-ready communities. And talk about stigma, language is key. One word that I'm, I've abandoned and I'm hoping other people will abandon is the word abuse to refer to a substance use disorder. And the reason I say that is because studies have actually shown that people receive better care if they're not defined as abusers. Think about the term abuse. Child abuse, animal abuse, physical abuse, spousal abuse, substance abuse. It's not, it's granted people are hurt by Addiction, there's no denying that, but to me it's fundamentally different to have a health condition of addiction Absolutely. than to uh, be an abuser. Absolutely. Just one example. So we'll make those your final thoughts. Cynthia, final thoughts. Well, I think it's all about communication. You know, people communicating at the forefront during and after.
whatever the situation is, communication and strategically thinking, not just reacting, but actually taking time to put thought and order into a situation. Good. Mary Lou, any final thoughts? Yeah, I would um, echo John's uh, remarks about uh, base, base what you do on what you know. And that is so, for instance, apply the social science research to the way you treat individuals coming into the criminal justice system. But I would also be very careful to note that we have to pay attention to the hard science as well. Because we know from hard science that substance use disorder, for instance, is a chronic disease of the brain. It's not a moral failing. It's not because you are a weak person. You have a chronic disease. What does that mean? That means that the it alters the way the brain functions. It means you're going to have relapse. It's part of the disease, like diabetes, heart conditions, and so on. And you think about that with other individuals who have chronic diseases, we don't tell them, just be on, make yourself better. You're on your own. No, we reach out, we help, we provide medication for treatment. We need to be doing the same thing with substance use disorder. Very good, thank you. John. Stop using your local jails or jails as mental health facilities. That's the challenge. We, since we deinstitutionalized the mentally ill beginning with Thorazine like in the early 60s, we've dumped people on the streets. We've never correspondingly put together uh, drug reporting centers. We've never, uh, you know, uh, one of the advocates in my community said, look, you want to you help my clients, and she's an advocate for the mentally ill that are in the community, she says, just give my clients their medication. Absolutely. Have a, give, have a, a giveaway center from, give away their medication. A lot cheaper than arresting them and incarcerating them. Stop using your local jails as mental health facilities. That's great final thoughts. I want to remind folks that September is National Recovery Month. You can go to our website at recoverymonth.gov and learn everything you need to know to put on events for 2016. Uh, this has been a great show. Thank you very much for being here. To download and watch this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, visit the website at recoverymonth.gov. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of mental and substance use disorders, to highlight the effectiveness of prevention, treatment, and recovery services, and show that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the free online Recovery Month kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain an electronic copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and access other free publications and materials on prevention, recovery, and treatment services, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.